I'm meeting Captain Hunter's son, Martin. One of the things that my father had to do was actually to write letters of condolence to people who'd been killed in the, in the regiment and uh, having to explain to the relatives, mother and father probably, that their son had died and saying what a good soldier he'd been. Not an easy thing to do. He was a, a sensitive sort of guy. He'd seen death and destruction for two and a half years or whatever. And, and do you uh, think the cumulative effect of doing this was just too much? Well, I think I think it did build up, frankly, yes. He decided that this slaughter was madness and he didn't want any further part in it. In July 1918, Captain John Hunter persuaded his twin brother Arthur, then serving as a lieutenant in France, to make a joint public stand. They would resign their posts as officers. It must have been a difficult decision. Their own father was head of battalion. It was his task to encourage young men to join the fight. The army too were unimpressed. Failure to do your duty was considered not only dishonourable, it was punishable by Field General Court Martial. At the National Archives in Kew, there is a surviving account of their trial proceedings. This is a record of the court martial held on the 12th of July 1918 in Calais and it records that the brothers were both charged with conduct to the prejudice of good order and military discipline. And in addition, John was charged with disobeying a lawful command given by his superior officer. He was told to go up the line to the front and join his men, and he refused to do so. That's an incredibly serious charge. Men were shot for less. The Hunter brothers were found guilty and cashiered, that is, dismissed from the army with dishonour. In addition, John Hunter was sentenced to a year's hard labour. Perhaps they were lucky. Some would consider their punishment lenient by military standards of the day. John, though, was appalled. From his prison cell, he wrote a letter to the Home Office protesting that this was no way to treat an officer and a gentleman. John and Arthur's sentences were, however, published in the London Gazette, the official mouthpiece of the army. It was a very public humiliation. How did the boys' decision to resign affect the family? They were totally devastated. Their father had a high position. In Belper, well respected boys for doing their turn at the front, and then not just one, but two of them mm. packed it in. And, uh, well, frankly, it was a disgrace to a lieutenant colonel. Did they ever manage to rebuild their relationship with their father? I, I don't think my father did. I think he was um, ostracised, if that's the right word. My grandfather cut contact, and I don't think the family recovered. The whole thing is, in my view, a, a total well, sadness, really. Back in Belper, the community was no less forgiving. Like all Conchies, the brothers lost their right to vote. And nobody would employ them. John could only find part-time work as a door-to-door -door salesman. Arthur eventually emigrated. At Highfields, the Hunter family home, their father struggled to come to terms with the stigma of his son's actions. We've discovered an editorial on the Hunter case from a local Belper paper in 1918. Uh, the copy's pretty grimy, uh, but the content is remarkable, because basically it reads like an obituary. 
It says, there is widespread sympathy with Colonel Morris Hunter in the blow, and that's the word they use, which has fallen on his family through his two sons being dismissed from the army. And then it goes through their military career as though they were dead and ends up again offering sympathy to Colonel and Mrs Hunter, their relatives and friends. Given that this piece is surrounded by accounts of other local Belper men killed in action, you do get the feeling that it would have been better if the Hunter brothers had died too. Lieutenant Colonel Hunter never forgave his sons. While he maintained close contact with the third triplet, Morris, who stayed in the army, he shunned John and Arthur. Until his death in 1946, it appears he never spoke to them again. For men like Lieutenant Colonel Hunter, conscientious objection was just an elaborate phrase for cowardice. This is Tynecott Cemetery near Ypres. It's the largest and most visited Commonwealth War Cemetery in the world, honouring the lives of more than 47,000 fallen soldiers. In the context of this enormous sacrifice, this vast roll call of the dead, how should we remember the conscientious objectors? the 16,000 men who refused to fight. In June 1917, Captain Stephen Gwynne, an MP and serving officer who'd experienced the horrors of the battlefield here at Ypres, addressed the House of Commons on the subject of conscientious objectors. This is what he said. There is one thing that nobody can deny them, and that is courage, the most difficult form of courage in the world, the courage of the individual against the crowd. I think he's right, and I think it's also right that these individuals, too, are not forgotten. Also not forgotten are the 45,000 men who built an underground world in that Belgian cornfield, discovering the lost World War I bunker, a Time Team special, up next. <laughs> 